All right. Next up, we have what everybody's been waiting for. Hey, everybody. Uh, today, I am very happy to have some of uh, old friends and new join me on stage. Mel Oxenreiter from the Index Coop. We've got Carlos coming up, Bitcraft. And then we have an old friend of mine, Lou Kerner, joining. So we'll, we'll let you guys uh, our own intros uh, briefly so you can get a feel for where they're coming from. We're just going to spend about uh, two minutes up here, and we're going to talk about money and uh, how traditional venture uh, interfaces with this new world of, of Web3. Um, and the first question I'm going to ask is all about sort of where, you know, what's the lay of the land, what's the market um, what it look like right now. Uh, but first, we'll do some quick intros so that, so that people can learn more than just your name, sort of uh, just quickly, like, you know, name, um, background, and, uh, and your, um, your maybe a touch on, on your relevance in, uh, in where it comes to the topic of venture capital and, and Web3. Mel? Uh, sounds good. Uh, my name is Mel. I go by Mel.eth. Um, with the Index Cooperative. I've been there full-time for about uh, nine months, uh, recently hired as a, a full-time core contributor, um, and I, uh, I'm, I'm a leader in the governance nest there. Um, so I coordinate all of our, our governance activities and all of the contributors that contribute into our, our governance activities um, over at Index Group. Hey, everyone. I'm Carlos. I'm a member of Bitcraft. We are one of the largest investors at the intersection of um, video games and crypto. Um, so a traditional video game investor dating from 2016 um, with our first fund and uh, last year announced our first crypto fund. So to date we've invested in a number of organizations structured as DAOs, um, including Yield Yield Games, um, Crypto Unicorns, uh, um, and a bunch of other sort of really cool projects. Hey, uh, I'm Luke Kerner. Um, I became a VC in 2012. I was focusing on... Uh, uh, tech companies founded by Israelis when I saw the crypto light on June 29th, 2017. Been crypto ever since. I'm now a partner at a firm called Blockchain Co Investors. We're a crypto fund of fund invested in 30 of the leading crypto VCs in the world. Uh, we also do, we'll do 30 one off investments this year and uh, three months IPO to crypto SPAC. And from a, a Web3 perspective, uh, a Web3 uh, cred, um, I'm actually giving a talk on community right after this, so that's going to rock, so stick around for that. And uh, I'm a partner at DowPlatform.io. Um, okay, cool. So state of the market. So what is going on with respect to um, fundraising when it comes to DAOs uh, specifically? Um, I guess let's, let's, let's start with you, Carlos, since, since you've, um, uh, you know, you, you've been quite active in the space and you're coming from a traditional venture capital perspective, GPLP structure. So uh, what, is the, what is the state of the market where, where DAO investment is concerned? Um, I think that from an underwriting perspective, the idea is still very much to underwrite great businesses with uh, strong long-term potential and good risk-adjusted returns. Um, I think that the instrument uh, tends to be different in a lot of these rounds. Um, I mean, there's still some equity rounds with token warrants. Um, but there's certainly a skew um, towards a simple agreement for future tokens, which is a variation of the basically the standard YC safe. Um, and there's generally been an acceptance of lower official governance rights. Um, so you know, not you don't have board seats and, and all that type of stuff. And in general, you're just a, a normal voting token holder as everyone else, so much more akin to common equity than pref. Um, but the the true governance honestly happens through the um, the advice that we give to the companies, the relationship that we have with the businesses. I mean, at the end of the day, um, if we're enforcing our um, will via legal protections, there's probably something that already went really wrong. Um, and so, insofar as like the way that we generally collaborate is through through helping companies, the loosening of the governance rights so far hasn't been an issue. Um, and then the other point that remains very open is the fact that the tokens really don't have a, a claim to the assets of the business and so um, it's a it's a different type of collateral that we have to get comfortable with um, but all of that honestly i think is is way more the the things you think about downside protection which in vc are, are more of a myth than than a real thing um, and it really comes to backing great businesses and building great relationships with management teams and being there sort of regardless of what the docs say um, you're entitled to or not 
Go ahead. Sure. So, um, you know, I think, you know, at a macro level, I have a word that I use to describe the tendency of markets to swing between bubbles and crashes. Uh, and I call that capitalism. And uh, pretty sure today we are in the bubble phase. Swing doesn't mean it can't go on for another five years. Um, you know, that's about how long the internet bubble uh, went on. But, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, valuations and money being thrown. Um, that, you know, I'm, I don't think the world has ever seen. I was there in 99. Maybe it hasn't quite gotten, Bo, I'm interested in your, you were there in 99. I mean, man, it was crazy. I went to a company that raised a billion cash at a $10 billion valuation in January of 2000. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, and massive amounts of money for DAOs, you know, and like anything else in life, it's storytelling, right? So, you know, the guy that started the Constitution DAO, wow, I mean, he told a great story, right? The guy that started Blockbuster DAO told a great story. Um, and, you know, whether, you know, you're, you know, a DAO DAO or, you know, a company like Curve where you're trying to make money, you know, for your investors, you know, this is an amazing time and hopefully tomorrow will even be better. All right, Mel, so time to jump in. So this is the reason we, we were so happy to have Mel on stage is because he's the recipient or his his DAO is the recipient of the venture capital. So from your perspective, um, you know, what's it like uh, to be on the, um, you know, uh, in, in this great seller's market and to be raising money? Um, I, I have to say, it, it feels pretty great. Uh, to come, uh, everybody wants to talk to us. Um, our DAO has had some success, uh, you know, at, at turning a profit, um, so we're we're very attractive uh, to capital. Um, I think we, we did one raise. Um, we had ten participants, um, each around a, a million dollars. And uh, at the time, we, we did it uh, because we had a specific need, um, and, it, and it was treasury diversification. So if you've been sitting here for a couple hours, there there was a presentation on that. It's a, it's a unique challenge to DAOs. We have a lot of our native token, um, which is our, our coordination token, our governance token. Um, but, but we need to pay contributors in, in something that they're not going to immediately sell into, you know, uh, th that's going to really take the value of that community and immediately um, reduce it. Um, so we did, this, we did this raise to effectively get uh, a different type of, of capital, really, um, so that we could, you know, function operationally. Um, so so that's, that's kind of how we came to it. Um, it was very successful. It's, it's really helped us out as a DAO. Um, so that's, we saw it effectively as we, we needed some partners to, to do something, to affect a result. Um, in that conception, I wouldn't say we necessarily thought of it, uh, it, it we, we termed it a VC raise uh, to, to make VCs comfortable. <laughs> um, but ultimately we, we had a goal that was something we needed to do um, and, we, and we went out and did it. Uh, we, we don't know. Um, but that's kind of, at least in my conception, the DAO conception, uh, how, how we think of it. So already we've uncovered a couple of real genuine differences between what a typical venture fund would, round would do. You'd have a lead that led with 60% of the capital coming in, um, maybe more, and then you'd have follow-ups, right? And that would be the traditional rate. There's 10 million from 10 participants, probably at about 10 million or a piece. So already we're talking about a completely different pattern from what, what would what we typically be doing. And in a traditional company, we would raise money and, and then pay people in dollars, and there was no other economy. So it's just a very different, um, uh, I mean, you're investing in an economy, right, Carlos? I mean, is, that, is that how you look at it when you, when you look at these DAOs? Um, I think that there's two, two basic frameworks that I categorize the, um, the, the tokens under. Um, one is by assessing network value, and the other is um, the traditional uh, governance route. So network value, particular single token models, or for utility tokens, or for tokens happy with utility. Um, I, I, you know, we talk about sometimes about like how a great game will go from being uh, game to government, right? Because ultimately what you're doing is you're creating a digital sovereign, um, and you're basically trying to create the maximum velocity of capital in that sovereign system, and you're clipping a, a tax, really, um, at either as a, as a fee um, or um, in, in some other way. But basically, you're capturing a tax on the economy, and your main goal is to get that, the capital velocity moving so that there's a lot of transactions that you can capture from. Um, and then on the governance side, um, that's really, a, I, I think, a function of, um, well, one is a function of the ethos of, of, of Web3, of wanting the DAO to self-govern. 
But I think a lot of it is also a function of trying to get around the lack of regulatory clarity. Um, and what I mean by that is um, it's, it's really difficult right now for you to really assign cash flows to token holders um, without running the risk of be being deemed a security. Um, but somehow, um, if you send all those cash flows to a treasury and then give the token holders the right to vote on the treasury, then the control of the treasury is seen as synonymous with the control of the cash flows or with the receipt of the cash flows. And that gives us another form of valuing those, but certainly um, very much looking at, at building ecosystems, building digital sovereigns and, and assessing that versus um, the traditional product model. Um, I'm interested to hear about what narratives that you're hearing um, in, among DAOs specifically, but you can expand it beyond that, um, that you just simply with. So what is, what would, what we might be holding as a, uh, a concept is just dead wrong, in your opinion. Lou, you want to? Sure. Um, uh, that voting is a good thing, that everybody needs to vote, and the more people who vote, the better. Um, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, you know I, I like to tell the story of the first television shows. The first television shows were people sitting at a desk with a microphone going, hey, now we're on television. They were just doing radio on television because they didn't know any better, even though they had this massive toolkit. And so I feel that's where we are now. We have this massive toolkit. And I don't know what it, what, what it is, but like my dream is, you know, you, you, you know who a river, who votes on how a river goes? You know, that's how I think that should go. It should go how kind of how the crowd wants it to go um, without needing to vote. The swarm that we had, which was uh, which was awesome. Yeah, was um, yeah. Go ahead. I, I was going to say that, that that to me raises an interesting question, right? So, as a in a in a VC raise, you acquire some amount of voting rights, right? So, if, if we don't need everyone to vote, and I agree with you, um, why then would is a VC well suited to 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 vote, right? In this token voting economy, um, in, in DAO, as I conceive of it, right? We have a governance token. Um, we want to get that governance in the best possible, the hands of the best possible deciders. Um, but how, how, how do you think about uh, your role as a VC as, as being a decider uh, in these token economies? Um, you know, I mean, quite honestly, DAOs have to be functional. Obviously, have functional governance has to be able to move forward, you know, in a way. And so I'm, I'm much less concerned with my voting power because if it's a dysfunctional DAO, it doesn't matter how much voting power I have. So the question is, is this a system that is functional? Is this a system, you know, where we're going to be able to move forward with? And that's more what I focus on. Got it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also think that the traditional VC is, is holding, at least right now where the market is and post round, um, they're holding a very different kind of token um, than traditional retail. I mean, you're, you're locked for two to three years, depending through total vesting. So, um, I'm not necessarily saying that like there's no wisdom of the crowns or that retail doesn't have like great opinions, but if I had to create a general heuristic of who I want voting for something, I'd rather have the person that is long-term locked into something than a short-term lock, right? Like at, just as a general incentives type structure. And also, I just wanted to mention just because, uh, uh, you know, there, there is some modest amount of hate I feel in the community <laughs> for VCs. And I just want to point out, we're just people, you know, some of us are good people, some of of us are assholes, but you know, it's it's really it's not like we're lawyers. <laughs> I would say, I'll, I'll admit, I, I was talking to Bo prior to this, and uh, I, I said, capital's usually the smartest seat at the table, right? We, we want that that capital to show up. We want capital to be interested. Um, I think from the perspective of a DAO, right? And and by by kind of giving that prompt, I, I think this is what I'm getting is we want uh, we want that capital to to not just be the cash. Uh, we need things that are more than just cash right now, given that cash is relatively abundant. Um, so strategic uh, partnerships, right? So, yeah, so, so everybody says that, right? right? Everybody said, like, oh my God, you're so, you're so smart. I want you involved. Come on. And then you, the, the, the check clears, boom. What, you know, you can't get in touch with them anymore. You know, and that's fine. You know, I'm totally okay. I'm not investing in any company because I think I'm going to add value. I'm investing because I think they're awesome. I can if they want to engage. The vast majority of the time, you know, running a company fucking hard, you know, thinking about calling your VC, I recognize it's not top of mind. 
And, you know, I get asked all the time, well, you know, what's your value add? What's your value add? And, you know, personally, in years of answering that question, I don't think I've ever done a good job because how do you convince somebody? But, you know, what I tell them is the truth about if I'm them. What I'd be more interested in is not getting somebody involved who's going to hurt you. Because, <laughs> you know, I've all been on board with fucking VCs who literally talk about extracting value. <laughs> They're destroying value, which is even worse. Are there terms that are... We, we, we see a lot of uh, innovation um, among... Uh, the DAOs, and I think that's one of the things that I get most excited about is, is innovation and governance. Um, how does that impact you as VEs and you as someone taking institutional money? Carlos, do you want to, can you weigh in on that? Um, I'm going to do it indirectly because I don't have a good direct answer. Um, I think part of the beauty of what's going on in crypto now is the ability to reinvent foundations and be able to build things more efficiently on top. I think one of the best examples of that are XYK um, AMMs, where when we think about the traditional configuration of financial markets and the need for middleman and the difficulty of, of really trading things and establishing um, liquidity, um, and then all of a sudden someone says, hey, X times Y equals K, and it's like, what? And like that thing works. And it's like, why does it work? And it's like, because the whole infrastructure is different and like these things are composable. And in and, and the other place where there's a lot of innovation is, is on the government side or on the governance side, because it's for the first time where you're actually able to submit a bunch of proposals into direct voting in ways that are completely impractical in traditional democracy. Um, however, that does create all the coordination problems that, that make you question, you know, how much should be voted upon versus how much should the community be providing directional guidance that the management team goes and executes on. Um, in general, I don't think that there's like a term per se that we've been confused about or we've had to reconcile with, but it's more about the concept of, of really holding something that's akin to common equity instead of PREF and being a soft influencer versus a traditional board influencer. But in practice, the way that that has played out is um, it's really hard getting into deals. And when we're getting into deals, we're getting into deals because we've earned our spot to be there. We, we're there because management wants us there. Um, so generally speaking, when we're there, um, we're getting asked a lot to participate and to, and to really have a soft influence or soft power on those situations so that it really doesn't come to the docks all that much. Yeah, okay, and, and let me just repeat some of what Carlos is saying um, or emphasize. It is, it is clearly a seller's market. It's hard to get in deals. There's tons of capital out there. There's not a lot of good deals out there. Um, and so there's... Um, I'm sorry, I said that backwards, but you get the point. The, um, the, the other thing you said is that you're not getting in a preferred stake, which is like the only place that a traditional VC would play in a traditional company. It's just not available in the world of DAOs. So for a, a, an institutional investor to invest in this world, they have to get comfortable with some very different terms than you would typically see in Sand Hill Road. Um, am I right? Yeah. So... Takes cojones. Yeah, and, pretty sure they never heard of token before a few years ago, right? I mean, it's all like on the so it's such on the cutting edge, right? And, and God bless them for actually taking, right? I mean, this is this is great. It does change things, right? And now, Melly, you get to, you know, how, how does it out in the, in the real world and like the coordination problems? You have capital. Is this working? Are you uh, that the coop raised ten million. Oh yeah, of course. There, okay. There's things we can do today that, that we absolutely couldn't do. Um, you know, I'd say I'm largely here as a full-time contributor because we did that race, uh, you know. So <clears throat> yes, it, it's valuable, right? Um, I think it's, it gets a little nebulous, you know, the term capital, uh, you know, I'd say in the traditional sense, it's, you know, VCs have dollars and they want more, um, <laughs> you know, and companies don't and largely the same. Um, I, I think in DAOs, you know, we have things that we need. We, we need liquidity for our products right now. We need, um, you know, that we have different needs through time. Um, and tokens aren't created equal, right? Um, so I think that, you know, to, to say dollars, maybe it's USDC, which are, is multi-purpose for us. We can do a lot of things, you know, turn that into a lot of things. But, um, you know, if you have dollars that you can convert to tokens, there's also a lot of things you can do for DAO. 
more beneficial than just sending some USDC to a treasury and cost way less, um, depending on what other sort of uh, you know, partnerships you might have, things like that. Um, I think that, that that's a concept, right, of, uh, I guess, that raise concept. Um, so it kind of flips it on its head. It becomes more of a conversation, right? Um, a, a governance conversation, if you will. Um, hey, what do we have? What do we need? And how do we get from A to B? Um, you know, and work with you to do it. Uh, so I think it creates this uh, th this very long conversation about capital um, and and need and sort of what what we're trying to accomplish um, that that can be ongoing and, and really be more of a partnership. And, and I think again, that's kind of how we what we come back to uh, when we think about it. Yeah. I want to ask um, one more question and then give you guys a, an opportunity to um, to to you know make a statement if you'd like about something that you'd like the audience to hear. Um, and then and then I'd love to just, you know, pull the audience um, because we've got some amazing resources here. So while I'm asking the question, you can think of your question you want to ask and then gather the courage to ask it. Um, what was my question going to be? Um, what has, ch uh, what is, what has changed um, from the fundraising perspective, if, if, if you have a perspective on this or any of you on, in terms of like approaching a VC, is this the same game that we used to play back in the, you know, in the late nineties and two thousands and teens, or is there something else going on here that we, that we should understand and sort of bake into our, our fundraising kind of mentality? I'm probably not a great person to answer. This was the first VC race, uh, that I really participated in, um, you know, from, from this side, uh, I've kind of seen things, for, you know, but, uh, but yeah, but I would say I'll, I'll, I'll defer on that one, yeah. I think that when you compare um, the venture capital asset class with, for example, the, the hedge fund, or not the asset class, but the industry, um, one thing that has always been the case with venture is that venture exhibits higher um, returns persistence than hedge funds. And so what that means is, uh, big non-financial advice, I guess, but past results tend to be indicative of future results in venture more so than hedge funds. And the reason why that is, is because you have a positive feedback loop where getting allocations into good deals and being a big VC fund lets you get into more deals. The fact that it's different from public markets where you can always just buy public equities or, or you know, in, insofar as liquidity allows you to. Um, all this to say that the the allocation game that is being played right now, I don't think is different. I, I'm not, look, I'm not young enough to have lived through the, the dot-com bubble as, a, old as an investor. You're not, you're not as, as old as Lou. Yes, yeah. Um, but um, ultimately, I, I, it, it doesn't feel like it's different from historical norms to have to compete with deals. It's just that the abundance of capital, particularly institutional capital that has been raised, means that there's more competition. But it's not a, like a, a, a new thing. It's just more of the same thing. Um, and it puts more emphasis in being the best sort of venture shop that you can be and doing the best for your founders and, you know, using that to perpetuate the cycle of um, allocation. So uh, my, my favorite VC joke is uh, VC are the part that says, hey, what do you want? He looks around the room and he goes, I don't know, is everybody else? <laughs> and that really is the job. You know, the, the companies start off and there is, I have found only one person who is actually able to tell that that company, that that founder or those founders are gonna be successful. Your VC, do you know who the only person who knows at the beginning for certain that they're gonna be successful is? No. The founder's moms. They are fucking certain because their kids rock. <laughs> And, and, but unfortunately for the kids or for the founders, they start off and they go around and they beg for money and they beg for money and they beg for money. And then to some small percentage of them, something happens and for some reason everybody thinks that they're going to be the next Google or Facebook and uh, Microsoft or whatever. And then VCs call them and beg to get in and beg to get in and beg to get in. And the, 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 the same VCs are in the top decile year after year after year for the most part because they have developed a brand, you know, as you were just saying, such that when they reach out and beg like everybody else, and God bless, they're calling you, that's amazing. <laughs> but for the most part, uh, you know, uh, so the, the idea of getting, you know, when people reach out to you first, you know, I would say in foremost, 
Get a warm introduction to a VC. Not that it's easy for anybody to get a warm introduction, but I'm overwhelmed with warm introductions, let alone cold introductions over, you know, uh, LinkedIn or, you know, even somebody's got my email address, God bless, but um, get a warm introduction. And, and, you know, if they're a friend of a friend, you know, at least have them sit down and spend some time and, you know, help you go through your presentation, how your presentation get better. You know, and I'll finish. I almost every presentation I see uh, uh, when I'm giving advice, I give the same advice. I go out to the back financial page, you know, to the, that has the revenue estimate, and I go out to the out year, and I add a zero <laughs> to the revenue. VCs want to hear a big fucking story. We want to hear uh, literally about trillion dollar companies. You know, a company that's going to be $10 million in five years is just not interesting because if that's what their projections are, they're not going to make it. That, that much we know. Nobody makes their projections almost. And so, you know, say you're going to be a billion dollar company and miss that. And then, um, yeah. any questions from the audience? All right, great. First hand up. Got a mic runner coming your way. Hi, um, my question is, what are the key factors or things that you look for in a DAO to determine whether it's a good investment for you to back as a VC? So, Carlos, you mentioned before that you were doing some evaluation of what the community looks like, right? You want to see community growth. What metrics do you maybe use to assess that? Um, early stage, it's difficult to talk about metrics because they're just not there. And to the extent that they are there, um, they're indicative at best. Um, I think er the, the earlier you go, the more you're going to rely on the team. Um, has the team... A done something similar to this before? Have they executed before? Um, will they have the ability to pivot from this idea when this idea inevitably goes wrong? Um, just like that type of, of team-based underwriting um, into a healthy TAM, preferably with low competition or lower competition, um, and with an engaged community to the extent that you can start, start seeing the, the, the seed of it being formed. Yeah, and I would agree totally with the last thing he says. For me, it's all about engagement. You know, I, I don't care how many members you have in anything. I care about how many engaged members you have. And are they getting more engaged or less engaged? Because every community is either growing or dying. Any other questions? Um, do you see a growing kind of competition between retail investors that are getting more capital right in these in these markets competing with VCs do you do you see that competition like kind of crowdsourcing I, I think that retails ability to compete on what I'd say is largely a level playing field in this market is is why uh, like, like you summarized uh, maybe VCs aren't getting the the preferred allocation um, that that maybe a traditional company would get um, there's a lot of options that that DAOs have and, and if the consideration is to put out your governance token to, to receive thing, um, there's a lot of mechanism design things that, that we can do that are not uh, necessarily just an OTC to, to a, a VC, right? Um, so, so I'd say the answer is it can be a lot more profitable if you're willing to be adventurous in DeFi, um, you know, to, to give capital in a sense to a DAO that, that needs it than as a VC. Um, and we see VCs even participating in a lot of these, these capital generation programs uh, that retail is are, are as well. Uh, so, so yes, I guess to answer your question. Yes. Yeah, speaking of that, uh, does it appear more attractive to a VC if the community hasn't tokenized yet? If they're if they didn't issue a token for governance or anything, is that more attractive? Well, the issue is most times when the company IDOs the thing rips to the moon, it becomes pretty impractical to invest in it as VC, right? And so generally speaking, if you're looking at a token that's already live, you would, instead of buying it at the retail cost basis, you would take a two or three year lockup in that token in exchange for a discount and then use that to buy down your cost basis. Because otherwise, like you're probably just not going to get a venture type return on it. All right. Any other questions? Good thing I got my running shoes on. Hey, Jerron, uh, guys, in, um, if you look at the future, 
Do, th do you think VCs will become sort of incompatible with DAOs? Because the way I look at it, you guys are a centralized place for uh, hard to reach also. Not, not, not all of us. All right, I'll finish up. And so, um, so, so it's, you're a centralized repository, and now there's this new model emerging where fundraising becomes part of the people's privilege, uh, if you will. But what do you guys say to that? Do you see a future where you guys, you're not getting access to these deals right now, you're hard to find, you're a centralized authority, you're taking um, shit, you know, you're getting voting rights into these DAOs. Is it even compatible in the future? Or potentially, are you seeing the future when other people don't? I, I think, uh, not being a VC, but trying to answer this question, I, I think that as we see it, the VCs that are working to try and understand uh, the needs of DAOs um, are, are going to be the VCs that are going to be around uh, in this new world. Um, I think also the, the thing we're finding is we're usually aligned with VCs in, in some ways. We, we have a treasury that is full. Um, and, you know, the, the question arises in almost every co conversation we have in, in a contributor, you know, uh, Anytime you get more than two of us together, like, what do we do with our treasury, right? Um, <clears throat> we know, you know, we have a, a plan for that. But, uh, but those things are, are considerations we have. And, and deploying capital in a smart way, we I think, is largely what to try, try and do. So, um, you know, I, I do think that there's a place for, for cap, you know, venture capital, really, which is just, I think, experimenting with capital at its core. Um, I think we want to be part of it. I think, uh, you know, and we're happy to, to engage, you know, with, with the smart money uh, to, to this point to figure out how to move forward in, in those positive some ways. I think, I, think, I think there are certain types of DAOs that have very strong value proposition in the market. An example of which would be Yield Guild and a few of the other guilds that when they're investing in a game, they're bringing a community and they're buying the assets and they deliver a lot of value. I don't think that the average DAO offering right now represents the same concentration of skin in the game, of highly experienced investors and operators who are singly focused on the market to advise an entrepreneur, right? And so what a VC shop is, is an agglomeration of professionals who more often than not have good operating experience and who are absolutely dedicated to market and market research and using that to back the best companies and advise the best CEOs. It's hard to see how huge DAOs are going to deliver on that, especially under the current coordination problems and engagement problems that they have. Now, can some VC firms call themselves a DAO instead of a traditional LPGP structure and band uh, get 10 people together that basically act as, as like a, almost like a family office or a super angel syndicate and be competitive? Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that most of that chop is going to affect the the VCs that aren't adding as much value, sort of like the lower quartile or, you know, lower half of it, right? And so I think the fight is to stay on top. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I got to laugh at the question because, man, the DAOs on average need a lot more help than the companies from the VCs than the companies do. Um, so, sorry, we've run out of time. I'd love to get to your question, but um, we do need to move on. Lou's going to take the stage now. Um, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for joining us, and, uh, and uh, I hope you're enjoying the show.